Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1.30 p.m. session in the developer and open source track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Optimizing and Improving Open Simulator Performance. Our speaker today is Justin Clark Casey. Justin is president of the Overton Foundation and one of the core developers of Open Simulator, working on many different areas ranging from asset and inventory to performance and infrastructure issues. He has created some of the better known data persistence formats for Open Simulator such as Open Simulator Archives and Open Simulator Inventory Archives. Justin also provides Open Simulator related consultancy services. Welcome everyone. Let's begin the session. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Emil. And uh, hello everybody to my session here, Op Optimizing and Improving Open Simulator Performance as, as uh, you very well introduced. So. I'm going to get going. I unfortunately do have quite a few slides, but I'm going to try and properly uh, paste them so that I don't just completely run through them. Um, OK, and they're going to be pretty plain slides as well, so I'm going to apologize for that in advance. So what am I going to talk about in this presentation? I know it takes a little while for the slide to go through um, compared to the voice. So, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, three things pretty much. First of all, kind of stuff about the system architecture. So really, this is the background for some of the uh, performance um, conversation and kind of some kind of some of the rules of farms and potential bottlenecks that we already know about. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be the components, the interactions between them, um, and then and then uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about some of the measuring and testing mechanisms for actually finding out what the heck is going on in a simulator because it can be very hard to tell. These things are really pretty complex things. I, I think of them more as really operating systems than uh, say web servers or app servers and they, they kind of have a whole bunch of things going on and a complexity to match. And then finally I'm going to talk a bit about um, the conference itself and the work done for this particularly for performance and how we kind of look to get 400 connections as a cat for the keynote. I don't think we actually had 400 at any point and I'm kind of I'm kind of a bit thankful for that, quite frankly, because I, I, it's really a bit of a voyage into the unknown. But what we did have performed very well, it seemed. And uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the ways in which we uh, in which we made changes or conflict changes or adjustments to kind of get to that number or, get, or make sure we had the capacity to get to that number. So a brief slide, really. I probably don't need to show this. It will come up in a second for you. Um, Really, it's like, why listen to me? Well, I've been working in OpenSim for a, a, a frighteningly long time now, uh, more than seven years, which is pretty crazy when I think about it. Um, I've done a lot of work over, over many kind of different bits, um, but some of the work I've done has been on performance analysis, and that has sometimes been for kind of my commercial and education clients when somebody has a grid that isn't performing well or they want to know how to structure a grid, then, you know, um, Sometimes they talk to me and, and, uh, and you know, I do consulting. So, so if we come to an arrangement, I, I go and, and maybe look at what their grid is performing, how it's, how it's doing that, and, and, uh, and what can be made better. So I've got a bit of experience in that area. I've also directly made some of the performance improvements, both last year in a cooperation with um, Krista, who did a lot of work there as well. And in this year, um, I've done quite a bit as well to, uh, to kind of get the numbers up. So, uh, but even then, even with that experience, even with seven years of OpenSim, I don't think I'm an expert in everything by any means. It's really performance in this architecture is, is a super complicated question. Um, and there's many, many different networks and server arrangements out there. So, you know, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give things from my point of view, but you know, even some of you around to the audience might kind of have different experiences than I have, and I, I'd be very interested to hear about them. So I'm gonna skip this because uh, we don't really need to say about disclaimers. Um so Kind of talking about the system architecture, so I'm going to talk about pretty much a hypergrid enabled grid installation, which is what we have in the conference here. And, and there we go, the slide's gone there. Oh, I skipped the slide, I see. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk about hypergrid enabled grid installation, which is what we have here in the conference, of course. But really, a lot of it applies to standalone. You just kind of have to ignore the grid service communication bits and the hypergrid bits. And of course, much applies to a non hypergrid grid installation as well. You just then ignore hypergrid parts. 
Um, I'm also going to, assume you're, going to assume you're pretty familiar with fundamental system concepts, both in terms of OpenSIM and what I mean by standalone grid and hypergrid and assets and inventory. And I think you know pretty much all of you are. Uh, and kind of some network stuff like what is HTTP, what is TCP, UDP. I'm going to assume you know what that is. Right, so I'm going to show uh, next, we should pop in a moment, the, uh, the kind of grid components here. So I'm just going to give a small pause because I think that would help. Okay, so this is my simplified view of the system with lots of colored boxes. So this is kind of like your grid installation, I, as I think of it. So on the, on the top left there, you have the viewer, um, and that communicates with the simulator on the right, say, and there's two kind of channels there. So there's both HTTP and UDP, um, and, and, the, and effectively the communication is bidirectional. But also the viewer also communicates with the public server grid services, and there, there's, that's things like classically login, for instance, of course, you have to communicate with the login service, um, and things like map, but also in, in kind of certain configurations like the one we actually have here, it also directly fetches, say, textures from those services. So there's a communication there. And also the simulator communicates with both the public grid services and the private ones in the back end. And I've just got a little box on the right just to show that it also communicates, um, also communicates with uh, other simulators. And you'll I actually just swapped the slide, but you, you'll see that all of that is HTTP, apart from one kind of channel, which is UDP between the viewer and the simulator. And so um, the next diagram basically shows a very simplified version of the hypergrid kind of situation. And Krista will probably be, be cringe here, but and really it doesn't show you a lot, quite frankly. It kind of shows there that there's the viewer again, there's kind of a home simulator, a foreign simulator, and say home services, grid services, and foreign grid services. And what really all this diagram does is show you that pretty much everything talks to everything else. It's like a complete spaghetti of communication. I don't think there's any relationship that isn't portrayed. Everything does have some kind of communication with any other uh, set of services. And maybe you could break that down a bit further. And you know, there are, as you saw in Krista's talk um, earlier today, you can break that down to different services, but, but really there's a hell of a lot of communication going on. Um, and really, um, so, so then we can go and talk about the bottlenecks. And so you can kind of see from that diagram and, and you'll see from the side a second that network, of course, is a, is a massive communication, is, is a massive kind of point of concern. There's so much of that stuff going on. And then we can also talk about, as a, as a second aspect, kind of processing, uh, obviously CPU and on the viewer side, GPU uh, storage and the software itself, how efficient is, say, a simulator, how efficient is a service. And so those, for those kind of four aspects, we can break that down, I would say, into three components. So of course you have your kind of classic simulator. Uh, you also have your backend grid services, and then you have the viewer or the client. And and really you could probably even decompose that further, but we'll leave it at that um, for this presentation. So I'm going to kind of talk about those aspects in turn now, and and talk about a little bit of experience and some of the rules of thumb um, that I've kind of um, discovered in in the course of working with OpenSim, although it's an evolving situation, which is always interesting. So uh, let's talk about network bottlenecks, for instance. So kind of like one of the, obviously the major um, avenues of communication is between the viewer and the simulator and the backend services. So as we kind of saw from the diagram earlier, there's, there's kind of two main channels there. Firstly, there's the UDP, and that is kind of all the packets that um, flow between the, the simulator and the, uh, and the viewer. So for instance, me walking about the stage now, and I'm, I'm glad Dave is focused on the slides because otherwise he'll have a fit trying to uh, kind of focus on me. But everything, every time I walk, for instance, I'm sending UD packet, UDP packets both up to the server. Uh, in, the, well, in this case, I should say the simulator. And then the simulator kind of redistributes those to all your clients. So then I kind of move and then hope very shortly later, you get packets saying I've moved, they can see me kind of strutting around on the stage. So that's one avenue of communication. And it kind of like the critical part of UDP is that it's low latency. And when I make a movement, or in fact, really even more critically, when you make a movement. So when you make a movement, even with your own avatar, that's got to go back up to the server, back to up to the server, and then back down to your client, because your client doesn't assume, it does some interpolation where you actually are moving, but it doesn't kind of assume that just because you're pressed forward that your avatar is going to move forward. Because of course, you might be his or, or kind of other barriers. So that's why often when OpenSIM goes wrong or when something goes wrong, you can rotate your avatar because the client lets you do that, but you can't actually move because the packets, for some reason, are no longer getting up to the simulator and then getting back down again. 
Um, so that is critical that those, that happens as fast as possible. But also there's the HTTP channel. And nowadays, the vast bulk of HTTP traffic is getting textures from the, uh, either from the simulator or in more advanced configurations from the service itself. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of data, especially if it's not cached. Well, even, as, you know, in the case that it's not cached, you've got to put a lot of information down from the backend service to the backend simulator. And so you, the critical thing for HTTP is high bandwidth. But because you've got both those channels going between the viewer and the simulator and the services, you kind of need both. You kind of need both low latency and you need high bandwidth. Um, and that's a, that's a situation, one, a problem one can see very often. So for instance, wireless con connections, some wireless connections are very good, but some wireless connections can be very bad. They, they, there can be a lot of latency. Even if you've got good bandwidth, you know, you could take a lot of time for the packets even to get to your router and then back out to your ISP. So that's one reason why we often say if you are on wireless and it's not working well, well, then you want to go wired. Um, but we kind of have a, a very, and I'm, this is a super approximate rule of thumb. Okay, I, can, I could stop walking around if that's actually affecting the audio. That might, might not be a good idea, sorry. Um, so the rule of thumb that really I've been operating on, uh, but it really is the rule of thumb, it's like 500 kilobits per connection. And that's really because of the need to pull down assets. If you're not pulling down assets, then you can actually get away with a very low amount of data. I mean, I'm only pulling down about like two or three, well, maybe five kilobytes a second, and that's very small. Um, so, uh, so really, again, there's so many variables. It depends upon your viewers. You can't assume, of course, that the viewer has your assets cached. So you kind of need to leave a good amount of bandwidth there. So that's, that's a very approximate rule of thumb. Um, for the actual number of connections you're trying to um, kind of run over a server. And I've just mentioned there at the bottom, pingtest.net is one way of also measuring uh, latency. Uh, I'm not sure how good a job it does. Latency measurement is kind of maybe not such general. And actually, there is another tool later on uh, which you can run on servers to kind of measure latency. But that's kind of one web thing. And that's equivalent to the speedtest.net. Right. So another network bottleneck potentially is simulator to simulator. So excuse me a second. So this is kind of critical, um, mainly in teleport and region cross. So when you teleport, there's an immensely complicated set of communication that happens both from, between the viewer and each simulator, uh, the foreign, say, say your local and the one you're going to, and between the simulators themselves, the kind of simulator A, which is your source, has to tell simulator B that, hey, there's, an, there's a new avatar on the way, there's a new agent, you've got to do some stuff to prepare for it. And then only then later on, it goes back to tell the viewer, hey, you're clear to actually communicate with um, server B now. And then the viewer communicates. So kind of having good latency, having, having a good communication rather simulator to simulator is very important as well. And again, if you're doing teleport, that, I mean, there are delays built into the system, but it is a somewhat time critical thing. So you really do want to be able to do that as quickly as possible. And so finally, um, I've kind of like called it installation to installation. So that's kind of like a, a situation where you both need low latency and good bandwidth, I would say. And good bandwidth is mainly because of the need to transfer, um, in the first case, attachment assets. So when, and I, I know probably some of you have, have experience and probably ongoing experience with difficulties with attachments. And even in the conference today, I know there's people missing that kind of stuff. So you kind of want a good, a good bandwidth there to actually be able to transfer those assets. And there's actually been a bit of work on this conference branch, which will get folded back into master fairly shortly. Uh, to kind of try and improve, you know, the reliability of that transfer. Um, but it's kind of like, a, you know, there's, there's a lot of optimization one can probably do there, and it's kind of work, a work in progress. But it's, uh, you know, occasionally we do lose these things. So that's kind of like network bottlenecks. And what I've not talked about there is stuff like services. You'll see I, I've missed a few things, like, like simulated the services communication. And I do think that's important. I think as we saw with um, Tranquility's talk earlier today, once you reach a certain level, it actually does become critical to have. And um, maybe he was talking more about the processing on the service end, but it kind of like these kind of, those kind of things become critical. But kind of at the scale that most of us are operating at, and I include the conference grid in this, it hasn't proved to be a, a critical issue. But that kind of might be, that might be another advanced talk for another time, and maybe by somebody else like Tranquility, in fact, who did a very good job today. So kind of moving on to processing bottlenecks. Um, so this is, of course, CPU and GPU. So on the viewer, I mean, as you can as you can very well appreciate, the more prims and the more avatars you're trying to display, the higher the load on the viewer. And that, you know, as you know, that's reflected in your basic kind of frames per second measurement. 
Um, and it's, of course, not a lot I can say about that on the server side. I don't have a huge amount of experience with viewers, but it's kind of like the thing to bear in mind when you construct the scene, as I'm sure many of you are very well aware, to try and keep down both the prims and, and really textures as well as another thing, um, to try and keep that under control. So moving on to the simulator, which I, of course, I know quite a bit more about. Um, again, it's the same situation. Uh, the more prims you have, the more avatars. And more scripts, not so much the textures, because you don't need to do a lot of those on the simulator side. But things like scripts, of course, then translate into higher load. Um, and again, this is where a lot of variables come into play. You could have heavily scripted simulator, and if the scripts are behaving well, and they don't, say, process a lot of events, perhaps, then it won't be such an issue. But if you've got a lot of scripts doing a, um, doing a lot of... A, a kind of a lot of heavy activity, then that is going to be a problem. And, and then you could combine that with more PIMs and more avatars. So, you know, that, that comes down to the perennial question, well, what kind of CPU do I want to actually have to run my simulator? And, and it does become the limiting factor there. So, again, in my experience, and this is running on things like, or, or attempting, or seeing people attempt to run on things like single core Amazon EC2 servers, OpenSIM does not like running on a single core. Um, I don't know if that's true right at the cutting edge, but you know, it's a very heavily threaded system. We'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. But, you know, I've always recommended really a minimum of two cores per simulator and the rule of thumb of one core per active region. And that's kind of a bit, that certainly used to be the case. If um, you would see a lot of performance degradation if you didn't have enough regions to cover, enough cores to cover enough regions. And that's, again, a bit flexible. If you've got regions which nothing at all is happening on, if they're just water, then as you can appreciate, there's very, certainly nowadays, it used to be actually worse, but nowadays there's very minimal CPU load from those regions. So you could stretch that and maybe have many regions per core. But of course, you've got, you've got, if you've got fairly normal active regions, then I would say as a rule of thumb, it's, it's kind of one core per region. And then there's the question like, do you try and run one region per simulator or multiple regions? Um, so theoretically, multiple regions per simulator should be more efficient. There's not been a lot of work done to make it really efficient because it's not, it's, a lot of people run, run, uh, run one per simulator, but you kind of, at, at the very least, you end up without the overhead of running another mono, mono virtual machine if you are running mono or, or another .NET virtual machine. I guess, as Myron says, 64-bit, um, I mean, there's always, always debate about 64-bit versus 32-bit. With 32-bit, with you do use less memory because the, uh, the pointers are kind of smaller, as it were. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know, so many machines are 64-bit nowadays, so that's what everybody ends up running on. Um, so, you know, the, the, the kind of downside to running multiple regions per simulator, of course, is that if it crashes, you know, the simulator is going to take all those regions down apart from one. And, and to be honest, that's one of the overriding reason, reasons that so many people run, run just one region per simulator, I would say, as well as the fact that it might be slightly less buggy. But to be honest, I don't think multiple regions per simulator is any significantly more buggy than, than a single one. Um, because I do, I do run multiple regions per simulator quite a lot myself, although not in continuous high usage, I will admit. Um, but also, really, I would say a processing bottleneck is, is kind of the software itself. The software does have certain inefficiencies, especially with regard to threading, and, we, and we'll come more into that later. So just to go through storage bottlenecks, as you'll see in the next slide in a second, um, really the storage bottleneck, I would say, is services. Um, and, and from that, it's asset storage, which really uh, kind of dominates everything. That is by far the, uh, the most amount of uh, storage being used. So, um, so what can you do about that? Well, one thing is to run a deduplicating asset service, and that is one where if you upload the same asset twice, then instead of having two copies of that asset in your asset service, you're only going to have one, and there's going to be two pointers to it. So in, in core development, there actually is a deduplicating asset service, and I do hope to bring that online soon, and that will kind of alleviate some of that, and hopefully a kind of automatic migration method where, where you'll just be able to reduce the, uh, the storage load over time with existing duplicated assets. But there's also today uh, another project called SRAS, and there are actually a bunch of references in these slides, and I will make these slides available. Um, and SRAS is kind of like a replacement asset service, which also does do deduplication. Um, right, and uh, also the question is, is faster storage better? Well, I mean, it's always important. I wouldn't say it's critical, but then that's in the usage scenarios I see where we don't have hugely kind of like concurrent grids. And maybe once you get to a high level of concurrency, then that stuff becomes more important. But kind of in the loads, I think most of us see it hasn't been such an issue. Um, and the simulator, it's also very good to have a lot of uh, storage in the simulator because you want to cache as many assets in the simulator as possible, um, especially in the hypergrid case where 
you know, in the hyperbig case, for instance, when an, when an avatar teleports into another um, another region, another far region, and if it doesn't have the assets for the attachments already, it goes back to the originating region and then asks it some exported asset service for for those attachments, and that can take quite a long time, as many of you probably have experienced. So. You want to try and keep that stuff cached as much as possible. And, and to be honest, it also gets loaded into the asset service. So it's kind of there as well, but it's always, always nice to have it kind of as close to the um, simulator as possible. Um, regarding memory and file cache, to be honest, I think memory cache was experimented with, but it, it, most people found it to be very unuseful. Because um, memory cache, to actually cache any textures, you always, already need a lot of memory. And the fact is, actually transporting those assets to the viewer is dominated by the network latency. Le network latency is an order of magnitude higher than storage latency. And it just, it just found that it didn't make a sufficient difference, to be honest. So, so file cache is, is kind of perfectly reasonable. So, um, so yeah, the, final, the kind of final aspect was software bottlenecks. Um, so you'll see in a second that really one of them is, of course, the viewer. And I know nothing about the viewer, so I will not say any. But nothing's a bit strong, but I know very little about the viewer, relatively speaking. So I'm not going to say too much about that. Um, but basically, services, um, so we take a little bit of, oh, there we go. OK, so services. Um, so just to say, Cora, I, I would say, from my experience, and I think from most people, it's file cache, which is uh, perfectly sufficient. And memory is just too difficult. Uh, you need too much of it. Um, so services, I, you see, I always have this feeling that, so in, in Open Simulator, we use this embedded C Sharp web server. I feel it's inefficient, but really, I, shouldn't, I should just say that's a hunch of mine. I've not done, I, there is a little bit of measurement stuff, but nothing really. Other people do say that it's perfectly fine. So, you know, it's kind of debatable. I, I feel it's, part of me keeps wanting to say it's inefficient, but that's probably because I haven't really done the measurements. Um, but really, the software, the major software bottleneck is the simulator. And really, this is because we, it will hand out free threads to anything. Anything that the simulator does, or at least a lot of the stuff, um, kind of ends up being done in another thread, or we're very thread happy about doing that. And, um, and that's kind of great if you've got a huge number of cores, I expect. But the, the, the scale of jobs is so high that it's very easy to overwhelm the, the amount of processing you have available. And I feel, and, and some of this is, kind of work in progress, you, you end up doing a large amount of context switching. And also, it holds up other jobs. So actually, I've made various changes. I'm calling them improvements for the conference, and I think they are. But there are kind of changes in that area. And there's also the question of Mono's, Mono versus Windows. Um, I think Mono, Windows did .NET used to be a lot, lot better than Mono. Um, but I think nowadays, the, the, the and, and again, I'm not backing this up with good um, kind of anything other than anecdotal, but I think there's not such a big difference nowadays. I'm perfectly happy running Mono for this stuff. There are differences, but I don't think the performance difference is huge. But again, that might be something that other people have other experiences with. Uh, another thing is you can offload some of the stuff like get texture and get mesh to a direct service call. And, and that reference at the end, there's actually the wiki page where I wrote up the configuration for doing that, um, which one can look at. Um, and that, that means the viewer gets the textures directly from the back end, uh, not the back end, but the public service rather than from the simulator, which may help. But again, we haven't done great measurement on that. Um, and handling bad foreign installations, maybe that's a bit, of a, a bit of a phrase. But it means installations where, for instance, if you kind of do a teleport and you ask the originating grid, hey, could you give me the assets for this, these attachments, then uh, maybe a badly behaving grid would open the connection, but never not actually respond to you, and so wait wait for the thing to time out, which can take as long as uh, kind of 100 seconds. Um, and then you end up getting things like maybe people don't see their attachments or, or kind of other kinds of issues. So, yeah, and, and of course, you can't avoid not being, you can't avoid bad simulators or, or bad installations, but you want to try and handle them as well as possible. So I should really remember to hit the slide next before, um, before my time is up. Um, so coming to the measuring and testing uh, question. So, Again, I've kind of run through these rules of thumb, but they really are rules of thumb. If you run a really accurate kind of measurement of your simulator, you want to actually measure this stuff. Because every install can be different. There's a very large number of moving parts. You could set it up any number of ways. I think as we've seen in some of the talks earlier on, there's, there's a huge number of ways you can start to configure this stuff. Um, so the question becomes, how do you identify and reproduce an issue? If you're seeing a problem with your grid, how do you actually kind of work out what it is and either, either be able to fix it yourself because it's some kind of configuration issue or maybe some other component issue, or of course, kind of bring it to the developer's attention and, and maybe we can do something about it. Um, and often that's much more than 50% of the work. If, once you can identify an issue, then you can fix it. Um, but identifying issues, particularly in performance situations, is really difficult. 
So it, that kind of brings us on to the topic of measuring. And, and there's kind of, unfortunately, generations of statistical systems at OpenSim now. And it's, that's kind of not a good thing, but that's how it is. The kind of the latest, and I say dominant because that's the one I've been working on for a long time, um, is kind of one that, um, that is called show stats. And you can see this in any simulator and even on, the, on this service as well by typing show stats all in the console. And that will show you, and you'll see it in the slide in a second, that will show you a large number of uh, kind of raw numbers and moving averages uh, for various things going on in the simulator. And it also has a facility to period, sorry, periodically record that data to a separate file and for later analysis. So I'm going to show you very quickly, and I really should have clicked next earlier then. I should stop mentioning that because um, it's, it's not good, is it? Um, so there's kind of a large number of things, and a lot of these are kind of obscure, right? Um, and a lot of those I've added, and I know for a fact you've kind of got to know the internals of how this stuff is working to make sense of them. But I am trying to document them, and there's another reference There'll be another reference to where I'm documenting them on the wiki, and other people, of course, have, have, are free to document stuff as well. Um, so you'll see here, for instance, if I type show stats all on a simulator prompt, you'll see uh, kind of different categories. So there's the client stack there um, on a region called Keynote 1, and it kind of has a stat to show you how many, how many clients have logged out because they've not received any packets or because we've not received any packets for a while. Say 60 seconds go by and we don't receive a packet, we kind of log this client out. So you can see how many times that has happened, and that might give you a clue as to whether something's going wrong. Um, uh, so many inbox and incoming packets are kind of like, you know, they're kind of complicated things. They tell you a lot about how um, UDP data is building up in the system, whether we're processing, processing it quickly enough or whether it's kind of building up. Um, stuff like teleport attempts, you know, how many teleport attempts have actually succeeded, how many have failed. Um, how many HTTP requests have we served on here on port 5000 on, on one of the HTTP servers? Some of the stuff around the scene, and I've missed out a lot of stuff. This is just a very small selection of the stats. Um, and, and kind of information about memory and how many, for instance, at the bottom, how, what CPU percent we're using. So there's a lot of data there that one can look at. And the reference at the bottom just goes to the very, and the references are at the uh, end of this presentation, by the way kind of an information about what some of this stuff means. And if anybody wants to know what uh, an obscure stat means, please ask on a mailing list. I'll be very happy to write it up. I kind of don't do that in advance because it would take such a long time sometimes to document, as, as kind of was mentioned earlier, that I kind of do it a little bit on demand sometimes, which may be a bit naughty, but there you go. Um, so what can we do with kind of like recorded data? So you'll see there, um, and this might not be very, this is a bit of a graph. So this is a graph, for instance, if you could pan out a little bit, Dave, okay. So on this graph, you're seeing CPU usage. So that CPU percent kind of thing we saw a little bit earlier, um, that is actually graphed here. So we've got a bunch of samples down the bottom, which is every five seconds, uh, according to that, if you execute the command stats record start, every five seconds it records a set of sample data, and then we can go and graph it. And, then, and I've actually written a lot of code this year to actually do this graphing, which is kind of like one of the things that took some time. But now I can see, for instance, this is, a part of the, this is one of the conference test runs. And you can see that at a certain point, we start using quite a lot of CPU, but we never kind of hit the peak. So this was useful to know that the conference is operating within, for, for a, kind of a, 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 a kind of like a 400 uh, connection load, it's operating within bounds. We're not running out of CPU, at least not kind of in any obvious manner. So this was really useful to know. Um, and I've just lost my last point. I should have gone through these things a little bit more quickly, but I don't want to kind of screw Dave up. Um, so the next graph you'll see in a moment is something called uh, agent time, which is the kind of section of the scene loop, um, which kind of measures, um, which actually measures uh, how long it takes to process some of the agent. Basically sending out a, a certain part of the sending out data to agents, not all of it, but some of the processing required to actually send information to other observing viewers that say a user has moved about. So you'll see from the graph there once it appears, and this was actually for four keynotes, that the, the thing you immediately notice here is these massive peaks. Um, in Keynote One, and this was one of the, the kind of like one of the um, one of the performance runs where we saw, and I've already changed it. I was a pity, but uh, you could see the peaks, and this was one of the performance runs where we actually met kind of freezing in the scene at certain cases, and this kind of showed you that it was in the agent time part, and I was able to make some changes which kind of like tried to avoid that kind of thing. And this graph is kind of thread pool work items waiting. So this is like items which are queued for for actually processing, but haven't got a, a thread to actually do them yet. And you can see, again, peaks here. And this is not what you want in a simulator. You want all tasks to be done as quickly as possible. So if you've got a peak in work items waiting, then that's a bunch of work that's not happening. And maybe, maybe that's critical work. Maybe it isn't. But it's the kind of thing one needs to look into if one is trying to get an absolutely smooth experience. So, so there's a lot of data one can um, kind of get out of that. And it, all this graphing code is available in my public kind of tools repository. Um, and you'll see that on the next slide in a second. Uh, there's a reference at the end called graphing. 
um, which uses Python basically to run through some of those stats files. And basically, you can choose which stat you want to display and see what the data is and um, see and, and basically produce a set of graphs like the ones I just showed you. Um, they're kind of it's kind of primitive at the moment. It doesn't do some stuff like um, it doesn't filter out outliers if you've got. Uh, kind of uh, some strange data points, the graphs kind of become, the scaling becomes bad. Uh, it doesn't do time series alignments. You'll see in the graphs that I was just doing samples. I wasn't doing time. But all that stuff can be done. It's a matter of basically coding. Um, and, it, and this can be, of course, very useful in diagnosing problems, although you do need to know really what some of these numbers mean. So that brings us briefly on to uh, testing. And I know, um, I think, yes, OK. Um, that brings us on to testing. And again, it's tools. One of the ones which is very useful is iPerf, which can measure throughput on TCP and UDP and latency stuff, um, basically completely outside OpenSIM. And that is kind of like, if you're having network problems, that's a very good tool just to kind of establish if your network itself is, is OK before actually looking at OpenSIM issues. And then service testing, there's a very little bit of this. I actually wrote a very basic texture load test um, thing, which again is going to be at the reference on, uh, on my GitHub repository. Um, but really, there's not a lot of that stuff. And I think there actually might be some tools in uh, OpenSIM itself. Um, I've looked at them recently, which actually can do some of the service calls. But I'm not sure they kind of like, like work for stuff under load. I think it might be more um, kind of actually checking if this stuff is working or not. Um, and then there are kind of more general test tools for HTTP, such as Siege, again, a reference at the end, which might be helpful for trying to test services. But I couldn't say completely for sure. Um, so really, the, the next the, the chief thing about testing is what? how do we test the simulator? My favorite tool, which I have worked on a lot, is PCAMP Bot, which is a way of actually loading through Live Open Metaverse uh, a load of bots onto a simulator at once. Um, and, and kind of like being able to more easily manage them, because it's, very, it's, it's practically impossible to get 100 real people. So this is the kind of like the next best thing. And there's kind of different behaviors in that tool, which you can teleport, make the bots teleport and walk around, and kind of stress your simulator out in different ways. And, I, and this is a major tool I use for performance testing in the conference. Um, and one thing, of course, is that it's not like a real viewer. The bots do do stuff like walk about if you tell them to, but they're not kind of simulating a viewer completely well. And that's probably going to be another focus of actually trying to make them more like a real viewer in their behavior. So basically, uh, let me very quickly talk about the conference here. So getting 400 connections um, into the same space was a huge challenge on the keynotes. And I can't say for sure whether we met it, because a lot of that was synthetic kind of bot load, which is not the same as I said. But, but we did get there at least with bots. And that's, that's you know, you've got to do that at the minimum. Uh, the problem with connections is that the load really does grow exponentially and not linearly. Every, every new connection you have to a simulator has both got to have its, all, its, all its movements seen by other people. And it's got to see all the other people already there. So it's a case that the more connections you have, the higher the load. And that does not grow in a linear fashion. So getting from 300 to 400 is massively more challenging than getting from 200 to 300, I would say. And the other issue is that I don't think, uh, maybe on some other situations, there are a lot of connections. But I'm, I'm not sure getting 400 connections in the same space has been done a lot. I know it's been done on Intel distributed scene graph stuff. But again, I think a lot of that was synthetic load. And, um, and it's very difficult to say you've done it until you've actually really done it with real people. Um, so, you know, there are, there are big challenges there. So kind of the considerations of trying to get to 400 is that can, can the other parts of the grid actually take it? And, and, I, and they, they kind of can. It was not a huge issue. Services did not seem to buckle under the load. There were some, there were some techniques of actually running multiple services, and they are, again, detailed in the wiki. But I don't think we made enormous use of them. And it's hard to say, but I, I don't think that was a major point for us. The other issue is do we have the bandwidth? Um, we're very, actually very lucky here in ha having very, very good bandwidth. So it's not actually such an issue for us. But it can be, you know, you've really got to take care of your connection. Going back to the early rule of thumb, for instance, if you say 500 kilobits per avatar, then 400 connections is kind of like uh, 200 megabits, I think. Um, you know, that can be a lot of data. So it's like, do we have that? And, and getting people to actually come on and cache assets really helps in their viewer. Um, do we have the CPU is another question. Um, I think we're kind of pushing it maybe a little bit. <laughs> we have 28 regions for 24 cores. Um, and yes, this is all on a single machine. Um, it appears to be running very well, actually. So it's not too bad. But of course, we didn't actually see 400. So it's kind of like up in the air. And this is, again, it's the kind of thing where you really don't know how it's going to perform until you get the real, real world loads. Um, and the other question was, do we want to use a VAR region, or do we want to run to run four neighboring regions? And as you can kind of have seen on the keynotes, we ran four neighbors. Um, and this was because, firstly, because of fault tolerance. Again, as I said earlier, we were, we were kind of, there was still a fear that the regions could go down, because one of the keynotes did go down last year. 
And you know, if you're running everything on one uh, simulator in the far region, then all four are going to go down at once. And whereas if you're running them on four separate regions, at least the other 300 people potentially are still going to be there. Um, and there's also the question of code maturity. Far region is very good, but it is also new. And other parts of OpenSIM have not been scaled up to cope with, say, 400 people in the VAR region is my very strong feeling. So, um, so that was another issue for not going down that route. So kind of what was the process behind this? And I know um, is, uh, I've, I've really, yeah, not a lot of time left. So I do want to some time for Q&A, but let me go through this. So, the, so um, the next slide is the process. And so as you know, we were doing regular Tuesday load tests, and that was actually to get real people on the grid, which is, of course, enormously helpful, as I keep saying. PCAMP bot is good, but it simply doesn't simulate real people and all the crazy things real people can do. No offense intended. Um, first, we ran the stuff locally, but that was actually really difficult to do because actually PCAMP bot does place a big stress on the system. It's really trying to emulate real load. And so you can't do certain kinds of optimization because that's really not the aim. So we kind of like started running them from EC2, which is actually very successful. It was very good to spin up EC2 machines and just run PCAMP bot and kind of hammer a, hammer a simulator. Um, we also did stats recording and analysis in these sessions. Uh, and then it was a case of once we identified a problem, it was trying to reproduce it because it's very hard to fix a problem if you can't reproduce it, if you've got to wait every Tuesday for a test. And then, of course, the test might be slightly different. So it was a case of actually trying to get the same kind of problem to show up under, under simulated load. And that was actually very good. We, we did manage to do that in quite in many cases. Um, and then it was a case of either changing open simulator code or making config changes um, and then repeat until you're completely exhausted <laughs> and you can't do it anymore. Um, so. Uh, Oh, OK, OK, I'm, I'm being quick. So what are the problems that emerged here? Um, so, so one of the things was that there was a, and you'll see this slide in a second, is that there was a lot of need to actually improve PCAMP bot. Um, the test tools themselves were not good enough. And that, you know, that actually took a lot of the time. Um, because you know, if you've got bugs in your test tools, then you can't necessarily rely on their output and what they're telling you. So there's a lot of bugs being fixed in PCAMP bot. Um, and then there's a need to uh, do graphing and analysis code, because none of the graphing code existed until I wrote it um, this year. Um, so that was another kind of major um, source of work. Um, and then, of course, you know, what do you actually need to identify a problem? We had to add more stats, more and more stats to the thing uh, to actually tell what was going on inside the black box. Um, so one of the things I did do consciously, and I don't know how necessary this was in a sense, is actually reduce the UDP traffic running between things. So there's certain things you can do to reduce the amount of data you need to send out to every client. And that kind of does help, I think, with processing. Um, and of course, your kind of network to other people. So that was one thing that we did. And also trying to deal with Open Simulator, not doing so many things at once. So being super thread happy, trying to kind of control that a little bit. Um, and because, of course, it had the potential to disrupt. And physics actually was another area we looked at. But to be honest, physics is not a big issue. Uh, none of these kinds of things where we have you know, where we have a lot of activity where people are just sitting down and they're not placing any stress on physics at all. So, you know, especially with bullet sim, um, bullet sim was, was uh, coped with the physics that we were asking of it very well. So that was not an issue. Um, so just to go through the things we actually did do, uh, which we'll see in a second. So the first thing was that there were various configuration tweaks. Um, so, so this was really, um, Again, reducing the UDP traffic and some of the other uh, communication traffic that we were using. Um, so the first thing is something called root rotation update tolerance. So this is the fact that when you rotate your avatar, as I won't do because I'll probably screw up the voice, um, is that every uh, for a certain rotation, you're going to actually send that information to other people observing that avatar and actually see that they've rotated. And it turns out that you can actually kind of like get away with not sending that very often. Um, because you're only seeing a certain uh, number of kind of um, the avatar from a certain number of angles anyway. So you can actually reduce that. So so there's a kind of a config setting, and that's not default at the moment, but you can kind of increase that to reduce the UDP traffic load there. Things like child rep reprioritization distance, I, I won't go into because we're running out of time, but it, that was a thing to reduce the thread work. And, and that basically says where your avatar is to a child region. So if you've got a region next door and you want to know what the chat distance is and whether somebody should be able to hear chat, then you kind of need to keep communicating that data to the next door server. But we weren't interested in the keynotes because in the keynotes, anybody can hear anybody anywhere. So there was no need to send that data. So I kind of bunged the number up to stop the messages going through. So that's kind of one of the things that was conference specific. And finally, there's this thing called child terse update period, 
which is actually observing the um, neighboring avatars in a region. And again, it turns out that you can actually skip a lot of those messages. So I, I actually ended up skipping one out of every four messages from neighboring regions. And there's no, for my observations, there is no actual discernible difference. Um, sorry, we skipped three out of every four. Um, all right, got it. Um, so again, a, another set of configuration tweaks was to pin an UDP. Um, there's this thing called adaptive throttles, which changes the throttle settings automatically depending on whether you're losing any messages or not. And to be honest, under very high load, that did not work at all well. Uh, I don't know if it was something we were doing, but we saw, we saw very bad behavior of the throttle. So we ended up disabling them, and that's probably something we, I need to go back and look at in the code itself. But again, this is one reason why there's a separate branch for this stuff, and it's not just mainline stuff, because I don't know if you know, we've got to fix that properly. But we ended up imposing uh, limits on the scene and client. So there's a maximum of 400 megabits going out from the scene and a maximum of one megabit per client. So even if you, if you have that set high in your viewer, you're only going to get one megabyte bit of data. Um, so that's another control point. Um, and I'm going to leave five minutes for questions. So this is probably going to be... So some of these tweaks will be standard. There are actually a lot of tweaks which have been standard, but some of them are kind of keynote specific. So they're going to be things that if you're trying to run an event like something on the keynote, then you're going to want to kind of look at that manually. But they're all configuration settings, right? There's no code you need to change. Um, so I'm going to very quickly talk about software changes. So some of it was pure performance. Uh, we had to, kind of, well, I ended up changing some of the way XML was processed from being as a stream instead of as a document. Document is very easy to do, and it's very handy. But it ends up loading everything into memory at once. And sometimes when you've got huge kind of attachment assets, you end up taking all the memory. And the garbage collection also appears to be very high. And, and CPU usage is also very high. So I did some work to kind of process that stream instead. Um, there's kind of perceived performance. So one thing you might notice is that movement for yourself, your free own avatar is generally very good. And that's because we're kind of like, we're not queuing. We're, not, we're kind of avoiding one of the queues for those movement um, packets. And I, I actually think that's actually a good thing, because when you move your avatar, you actually want to see it move. I think when you don't, when you move your avatar and it's laggy or you're not moving at all, and I think that my, my perception is that that's a bad experience. And I think it's better to, uh, to actually kind of prioritize those. But maybe that's another kind of somewhat debatable kind of thing. Um, so again, the major thing, though, was to make OpenSim fastly less thread happy. And that was actually to, um, done by queuing uh, certain kinds of processing. So instead of, say, trying to do all appearance and attachment changes at once, instead we actually queued them and we do them sequentially. And same, same for in, uh, handling some incoming and outgoing UDP stuff. But the problem with that approach is that it is complex because you need to desperately avoid one task not blocking all the others. Once you start doing them sequentially, you've got to stop one blocking. Um, so you've got to be very cautious about that stuff. And I think that's going to be kind of an active, an active thing. So really, um, I know there's a, there's a brief start on future directions, but I'm not going to uh, talk about too much, that too much. Basically, I do think there's room for more efficiency, and there's always room for bug fixes. So as you saw, we're not on the top of the CPU usage for this region even. Um, yes. So you will see that slide flash by, and this was kind of like a very quick talk. I did have too many slides. Um, but thank you very much. Um, and I'd just like to ask, are there any questions? I'm, I'm going to ask for Q&A. I really gabbled through that. <laughs> Crazy, I feel like. And it was, it was fun. the most important performance tuning. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it's very hard to say, actually, because what happens, as you can probably appreciate, is that you fix one kind of performance problem and you almost immediately run into the next. Um, I would actually say, from my perspective, the most important thing was actually making avatars move a lot more responsibly, your, at least your own avatar, not other people's. Um, that actually really makes me feel better about moving in the environment. And that's a very much a perceptual thing, um, because it's not, you know, you're not necessarily improving performance anyway. You're just kind of like changing the priority of how this stuff goes out. So actually, I would say that was the, actually the chief thing for me, which is interesting, because it wasn't like a pure performance thing. So about slow requests, yes, you're all, anybody who runs a, a, um, a simulator, I expect has seen the huge number of slow requests information. 
Um, and yeah, the, the problem is those can originate from so many sources. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the place where you do see those is, is when you do outgoing requests from the, uh, the simulator usually. So I would say that a lot of the time they're actually services. Actually services can be very slow to respond in, in, uh, in, in certain situations and I didn't really cover that. Um, and I think, um, I think especially the asset service can be slow to respond. And again, you're putting a lot of data out there. I mean, there is also this debate about whether a file system is better for storing assets or a database. And from all, all I've kind of read out on the net, there's no consensus to this issue. I mean, some people say file, some people say database. There's kind of no clear, hey, one's better than the others. I know some people are much more keen on file, but I'm not convinced because I'm not seeing anybody really give you know good numbers as to say one's better than the other. Um, no sequel. I, I think the stuff that um, that actually um, Tranquility talked about today was very interesting because he's talking about uh, being able to scale these things, especially in the heavy inventory situations. Um, certainly that would help for services if you do have slow service response. That could be a very good thing. Um, the, the thing with no style async processing is actually managing that. So one of the things, I don't know, and this is a complicated area, and really, you know, I'm just doing this myself, and I don't always know what other developers think of what's happening, but you know, it's almost to the point where you want a scheduler in OpenSim itself to schedule all the tasks being attempted. Kind of like I'm, very, I'm kind of a bit uncomfortable with that because it's kind of like almost something like you should leave the operating system to do. But we have so much of this asynchronous stuff going on, and and you you kind of stuff some stuff is higher priority than others. That it's almost to the point where you kind of want to manage that much better than the kind of fairly ad hoc ways that we're doing it now. Um, so um, so that's actually kind of an interesting future direction. That it'd be it'd be nice to kind of explore as to whether we can much better manage and get to much higher CPU use, utilization for a simulator uh, than we have now. Um, so yeah, I mean you know serendipity. I, I I would love to see people experiment, but what I always want to see is hard numbers, right? I mean there's a lot of anecdotal talk about hey um, approach H X is better than approach Y, but I'm kind of a hard data person. So, uh, you know, I would want to see those approaches attempted and then say, hey, here's my study. This thing's a hell of a lot better because, hey, look at these numbers. And that would the, that's the kind of thing that would convince me. Uh, other than that, you know, I, I kind of like it. I'm always a bit skeptical. I'm, I'm the cynic. I mean, I think there is a lot of room for improvement. I don't think we're anywhere near uh, a very great software efficiency with this stuff. And some of that is because is it's a complex kind of architecture, right? It's like running a really complicated website. Even a simple grid is like a, a complicated website. And as you know, there's web websites approach this in a very different way. I'm not talking, I'm not saying anybody has to be on the scale of Facebook, for instance, but kind of as we saw, there's, there's many different ways of approaching these problems. And kind of like, uh, you know, it's getting more technical, if anything. Um, so, uh, but to be honest, uh, the thing is, I, I want people to use this stuff, right? I want the basic, I want the out of the box experience for OpenSim to be a good one. I want it to perform well. Um, and maybe we make some compromises. We do, for instance, have SQLite as default database. And that's because, you know, it's very easy to get going with SQLite. Uh, I've, I've said it both ways in, well, in two sentences. Um, whereas MySQL is definitely performing better in any situation. But at the same time, you know, you want to be, have it accessible. But in general, I want a good out-of-the-box experience. I'm always keen on improving the basic services. But at the same time, I have to say that if you've got a lot of you know, technical capacity to throw at something, then there are inevitably improvements you can make. If you're running a big grid, then you know, if you soup up your services, maybe you do some, something fancy with Apache Cassandra, then yeah, that might be better than running out-of-the-box OpenSim. And, I, I think that's just inevitable, unfortunately. I, I just think that's one of those things. It's like running a complicated website, right? You can't just simply bung Apache on and have that put, have that serve every website ever. You know, at a certain stage of complexity, you end up doing more stuff inevitably. So, you know, that's, that's just my feeling on that kind of stuff. So I don't know if... Uh, so custom mono settings, Clovis. Um, uh, so there's a lot of threading settings at OpenSim, and at the moment we have a kind of a default thread pool setting, which is massively overcommitted for the number of cores anybody ever has. And I, I'm not sure that's the best thing, but it's kind of like a complicated question because when you, the luxury you have when you set, when you basically send anything off to its own thread pool thread is that if that thing is held up for some reason, maybe it's making a request to a backend asset service, maybe across the hypergrid, and that asset service does not respond in time, then that's not holding up any other work. All the other threads can still proceed. Um, 
so it's kind of nice. You kind of get rid of the, the problem of trying to manage that stuff if you just throw it on another thread. But of course, if you just throw it on another thread, sooner or later you end up trying to process like 500 things at once. As we have seen from my stats, you do end up doing that in certain situations. And the whole thing just seems to grind to a halt, basically, as you just frantically try and pro progress 500 threads on a 24-core system. It just doesn't, doesn't work very well. So physical servers versus cloud servers. I've... I've seen OpenSIM run very well, or, or at least run well for lower, lower concurrency on EC2 services. And of course, I know Kitely are using EC2, although they're doing it, I believe they're doing it in such a way that they use, they use very, very large instances, and they kind of manage um, kind of individual regions on that. They don't kind of like spin up lots of um, instances. But other than that, I mean, it seems to work for, um, very well. I mean, the virtual stuff has come on hugely in the last period. It's, it's how so many people do things anyway with cloud systems and all the rest of it. So I think... You know, I think it's very well. And of course, if you do virtual, it can give you much better management options to kind of like be able to spin up more simulators and not have to kind of relate those necessarily to physical servers and all the rest of it. So, I, and, you know, I think it's perfectly fine. But of course, you do want to make sure you've got sufficient CPU capacity um, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, the cloud situation is that if you, my belief is that if you know you're going to be using a certain amount of physical um, kind of uh, processing, then you are better off getting the physical machines. I think it's more kind of a thing that it, in some situations, for instance, education, some of my, um, the education people I've talked to is that they actually do have large numbers of machines. So a virtual kind of system is very handy for them because they can kind of like control uh, the number, the, you know, the number of virtual machines have spun up. They've, got a, uh, they've already got a load of physical servers. But if you're just kind of running a grid and, and you know you're going to use a physical server, then maybe that's better. But of course, there's a the question of, well, how do you determine kind of fairly unused sims? If, if, if people are holding a party, say, on two sims running on the same server, then, you know, in the ideal world, you might kind of separate them out and run on different servers. But of course, that's kind of like, you know, you're getting into complicated management situation there. Um, so I don't know the answers. These are all very good technical questions. Okay, so uh, does anybody kind of have a, have a last question here? Uh, sorry, a last question. I might just type that. That might be better. So actually, one thing I did want to say quickly is that, um, yes, the ETM on Ghost Hitting Master is actually what I was just about to say. So. As you know, I've been doing a lot of this work on a separate branch called Ghosts. And that was originally because, as you may have noticed at the conference, nobody can bump into each other. There was a hack done fairly quickly to stop avatar to avatar collisions back in the time when I thought physics might be an issue or, or appeared to be an issue. And that was more kind of a bot issue in the end. Um, but then, of course, it came in. There were certain other changes I wanted to make very quickly, um, which I knew would work for the conference, but I didn't know necessarily would work for every single use case out there. I think many of them will, um, but some of those might you know, might have more debate from people. And of course, we can always do that in Barstow. If there was a change in Barstow, that's always open to debate and questioning, you know, as they're not fixed in stone. Um, but I do want to go back through the changes I've made and kind of like think about, especially fixing some of the hacks like the avatar to avatar collisions and some of the other stuff. And then and then once that's kind of like fixed up, we can merge to Master and, uh, and everybody can just kind of use that branch and we can go forward again. So I hope to do that fairly soon. I do need to take a holiday. I, I desperately need to take a few days off at some point. But... Uh, hopefully that will come back. That no, not hopefully, but that will that will happen fairly soon, and then uh, kind of everybody can see the kind of improvements. Um, hopefully, we've been able to make. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>